Hi. Firstly, uh, a big thanks to the, everyone at Google for inviting us, and thank you all now for listening. Um, Hopefully. Hopefully, yes. Uh, hopefully you find this interesting. So uh, I'm Ed Harrington, and this is Anthony Sherritt. And together, we run a design studio and a type foundry. Uh, so our design studio started in way back uh, when, uh, back in 2009, where we initially met in 2006 at Brighton University. Um, and we had kind of very different like kind of social groups and then slowly became friends. Um, but I'll kind of come on to that shortly. But um, shortly after setting up the Entente, which was our design studio, which means the friendly understanding. So uh, the Entente is a pact between England and France in 1904. Um, so the understanding we kind of see as both like an understanding between ourselves um, and also between us and a client or us and collaborators. Uh, so it's not just kind of like a fancy kind of word. Uh, it kind of has like kind of intrinsic like value to it, I guess. Um, alongside that, we also run Koloff and Foundry, which is kind of more forward facing, I guess, than our design studio. Um, it actually has a website um, rather than our design studio that doesn't. But um, we release uh, typefaces not just ourselves for, uh, that we ourselves design, but also uh, through a series of collaborators uh, that are kind of worldwide, really. And this, in general, informs, uh, creates the, our office uh, of like typography, I guess. So we, we work on a range of different kind of projects, uh, mainly in the cultural sector. Um, but kind of starting uh, back from 2009 when we first set up, um, we kind of had the idea of uh, setting up a studio in during university. Um, and it was in like our second year in 2008 that we randomly uh, we were walking home uh, back to our like uh, back to our flats and we kind of got onto the subject of travel and we decided, I said randomly that uh, I wanted to go to go to Japan. Um, and and foolishly agreed, um, and then two weeks later we were uh, sitting in a bar in Shinjuku um, getting inebriated and getting the idea of setting up a studio at some point, because it was pretty much the worst point of the recession uh, at that point, like uh, in like late 2008, early 2009, um, so we thought what better kind of time to set up a studio. Um, and subsequently, uh, like during, during university as well, because we thought, well, we're probably not going to get jobs elsewhere, so why not kind of create, create our own? Um, and this was, so over the kind of almost seven years now, we've worked on a wide range of projects from uh, like small publications, exhibitions, uh, all the way through to like large global scale um, typefaces and type families that uh, are both like commissions for us and then also like our releases that we've kind of put out into the world. So we work in quite a specific way. Um, when we kind of started the studio, we kind of knew that we both had our strengths and weaknesses, and we kind of wanted that to inform our studio practice and what our output was. So um, kind of straight up, we kind of got a piece of paper and folded it in half and wrote down what we thought was good at. So Ed's really good at making tea. I'm better at making coffee. Um, so that's kind of a rule in the studio. But this also comes down to more serious things like type design and technical aspects of projects and a more overview and like creative direction. So Ed won't work on a project um, or in, in a kind of task within a project that I'm working on. We really kind of split our task into two kind of different um, estates. But we also see that everything is still connected. Everything is kind of a continuous narrative that, um, that we use our design commissions to inform um, our kind of type practice, I guess, that these two companies that we have, Colophon and the Entente, are still totally kind of inter interconnected. They're like a Venn diagram where the kind of middle part overlaps and informs one another. Um, so Colophon, as Ed mentioned earlier, there is, isn't really just us. It's kind of now a kind of larger collaborative network of people that we work with um, closely, a couple of them in this room somewhere. I can't see them, but they're there somewhere. Um, but we kind of work independently together and we we dip in and out of working with different people at different points, but we really enjoy that. And there's a kind of a lot of um, richness that comes from kind of working with different people with different aesthetics and ideas that we can put within a kind of trajectory of our practice. Um, so this is our current roster, um, eight, eight of us at the moment. Um, so ourselves at the top, obviously. Uh, Hamish McGill from Studio McGill, uh, 
Ed's old tutor at Brighton University. Um, Benjamin Critton's a New York-based designer, um, based out in Brooklyn, and we work very closely with him on US-based projects. Alison Haig, somewhere over there, uh, is a designer at Wolf Orleans. Um, Dries Will Waters was um, a student at the Workplatz Typography in Arnhem, and uh, now is based in Belgium. Oscar Nguyen is a small ty um, design practice based in Sweden. Anthony Barrow, also present somewhere. Put your hand up. Um, the graphic artist. Uh, and uh, Hoomkin is a South Korean based designer based in New York. So it's kind of like a very different kind of um, set of people. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, we work with these people in very, very different ways. So, for example, Alison, who I mentioned, we work like, very, very closely on Perfin through the beginning. But someone like Dries, who comes to us with a nigh-on final pro product that we release through Colophon. So we, we act more as a kind of distributor or a kind of a release agent for him. But it doesn't mean any, any more that the, the kind of collaboration is less. It's just in a kind of different way. So we're going to talk uh, through kind of two main projects uh, today. Uh, the first is Castle Down, which is a project that started in 2011 and then finished in kind of late 2012. And this was a type family for a school um, and actually a primary school. So when we kind of first got the email about this, um, uh, we were quite like intrigued and we were like, right, OK, so a, a primary school wants a, type a typeface uh, for them. And so that instantly rang. Uh, alarm bells of the three biggest uh, elephants in the room being Comic Sans, Times, and Ariel. Um, and obviously, we thought there's nothing wrong with all of these typefaces, but in the setting of a school, there probably is. So, like, it's probably not so good to do to have this to have uh, to teach children how to like write. So. We, got, we thought, right, OK, this is like a really interesting project. Um, and we went back to them with a price. And they, I think, like the headmaster kind of probably fell off his chair and was like, we can't do this. But we realized then, actually, this is kind of like a rare opportunity that you get to design something that actually kind of can make a, a bit of a difference uh, through design. And so we decided to kind of work on the project with them. Um, but how do you kind of like stepping back, so once we taken on this like really challenging brief of how do we create a typeface that is kind of fun and approachable uh, and that, that the kids like with Comic Sans, something that's like authoritative as, uh, as Times, but then as readable and accessible as Arial. Um, so we set about creating a typeface, and this is what we came. Uh, so we created the typeface Castle Down, named in honor of the school. Um, hopefully one day there'll be like a little plaque somewhere in the uh, in the school, but we can maybe we can a wing, maybe a wing. Yeah, yeah we can but hope. Um, so the idea of creating Castle Down was to create something that was as close and like obvious as to like handwriting uh, as possible, but but still be kind of uh, authoritative and readable um, when you're kind of using it. So the the teachers and like, the headmaster specifically wanted a typeface that they could send out to uh, like governors and students' parents, um, you know. But that obviously wasn't Comic Sans or like kind of playful. But then also they needed a version that could be used with the kids and that they would find, you know, they could relate to. Um, so we set about kind of like unifying the the forms as much as possible. Um, you know, like even looking into like, you know, like simplifying the characters as much as possible so there's no like double story g's or double story a's where you know you just don't write them like that um you write them like this um and also you know as the saying goes like you you mix up your p's and q's so we wanted to kind of create wherever possible if there were um like uh, what's the word uh don't know what is it? <laughs> um, uh, mirrored, mirrored versions of the characters. Yes, yeah, symmetrical. <laughs> uh, we wanted to try and make those as different as possible, uh, wherever possible, to aid in like the legibility of the typeface, but without becoming like too quirky or kind of too uh, like obvious, really. Um, alongside this, we also um, created the typeface to be still relate to Comic Sans in the way that it's like it, all, of the, all of the corners are slightly chamfered, so that it gives it a little bit more of a friendly, softer approach. Uh, the terminals are also like quite wide as well to aid in legibility, especially down in like smaller sizes. Um, 
So for going on there, we decided to kind of take a stab at our version of like Comic Sans, and we labeled this like the fun version that could be used throughout uh, all of the materials that would be used throughout the school. So we'd get rid of any use of Comic Sans and replace it with, with this version. Um, so it's, it was taken with the same DNA uh, of the regular, but it was italicized by four degrees and then all of, the, count, all of like the, the terminal ends were fully rounded so that it kind of gave that like softer and really like friendly uh, impression um, rather than like the kind of regulars. Like, so it drew from that and amplified it. Certain elements like the numbers, for example, were, uh, this is the regular here, and then into like the fun version, it, they became a lot more expressive and a lot more kind of uh, friendly and, uh, and fun that we actually stemmed from workshops that we did within, within the school with the, with the children. So we ran a series of four workshops with them where we got them to um, r choose like their favorite fonts. They got, we got them to kind of like design, uh, design things with, with fonts from the computers. And that really like got, gave us an impression of what they wanted from the typefaces as well. So it wasn't just us going away and designing a typeface for them. Like it was directly input from them. So like they really had like a um, a real kind of strong input into into the design of of the letters. Other things like uh, the characters here, for example, like going into um, from the regular into the into the fun version, it gets a lot more kind of. Uh, cursive adds in the, like small like telltale signs from like cursive. So when you write an N, for example, you're always going to kind of leave a little flick, as if to go to the next character, um, which I'll also come on to shortly. But uh, we wanted to add in like these related as much to like what the children were writing when they actually write these letters, so that they can see similarities between the forms. So they're not seeing serif typefaces with like these like decorative elements that are kind of of no need to them. Uh, no necessity to them uh, at, at this point in their lives. So looking at comparing, like, for example, Ariel, uh, I said uh, earlier about the, like, the double story A, so we got rid of that and tried to unify the forms um, across, um, and also like, kind of other areas as well, like really tried to simplify the, in, into, like, the most minimal amounts of strokes possible. Also comparing uh, like, kind of Comic Sans, for example, um, we looked at this like typeface quite extensively, um, and we were trying to work out why it wasn't right. And you know, obviously, a lot probably no one here likes it, but it is quite still. It's a very well-made typeface. It's it's it does its purpose, but it's been f taken so far out of context that it's now associated with like being a bad typeface. But that's not the case. So we wanted to take like some of the charm and you know like it's underlying values from this, but then introduce it into, into our kind of typeface, but without having like, it kind of, it's like dumbness or like it's wobbly kind of lines. We didn't really like that, but we liked some other kind of elements of it. So this was its kind of replacement, I guess, of uh, Comic Sans uh, and uh, the fun versions. And then finally, um, this was the full extent of the typeface family. So uh, a range of weights, a a dotted, stylized dotted version, uh, and then also a cursive version. So the cursive version was a uh, a continuation of the project where they'd commissioned like the first half of it, and it went really well. It was really well received, and they were like, right now we want a version that can we can teach the children how to do drawn up handwriting. And we thought, right, this will this is going to be great. This is sounds like a great idea, um, but I'll shortly come on to that. But it because it kind of got used in the, um, in the school. So this is part of uh, the, the typeface being used. Unfortunately, we didn't design this. but Def uh, Definitely didn't design <laughs> it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's being rolled out throughout the school, which is great to see. So the cursive, um, we thought, right, yeah, let's do it. And then soon after, regretted that decision because it became a technical nightmare. So how do you go, and go about creating a typeface that joins up dynamically and has to be like smooth and consistent. Um, so we, we worked out like how, how many joins there were. So roughly like A to A, A to B, all the way through to like Z to Z. Uh, and that was like 700-ish characters. Um, we thought, right, okay, that's not too bad. 
But then we came up wait for it, wait for another it. kind of uh, hurdle was that it wasn't that. It was 18,000 because you have a beginner, beginning, middle, and an end. So there was these 18,252 combinations. Uh, but within that, there was a connection from letter one to letter two, and then connection from letter two to letter three. So technically, it's 40,000. But who's counting? Um, it was, <laughs> it was a, the problem was, was when you're going through it and you're checking it by hand, uh, and, <coughs> and then you see a character that kind of like jumped out and wasn't correct. And you, then you kind of spent the, next, uh, the rest of the day trying to figure out where that bug kind of came from. But uh, I'm not one here to speak about bugs in code, as I'm sure you're all well aware. Um, but the way we kind of broke this down was, so you know, we wanted to unify these into groups to make our life a bit easier. You know? So um, we decided, obviously, there was going to be a first, a middle, or a second character, and a third, like end character. So for example, the standalone first is where you just type in an A. It has like the preceding tail, so how you, uh, you always start at the baseline uh, like when you're teaching cursive handwriting. Uh, it goes around, draws the letter, and then finishes with a little tail to go on to the next one. Um, the, the first, like, um, and then we kind of grouped, uh, grouped them into, into different kind of like levels of where the characters would join onto next. So we had a bottom, a middle, a top, and then an exception. So with the second, uh, with the second on the second row, you have the characters like the first, but they don't have the preceding tail because that's taken care of from the character before. And then finally, you have the third character, which is like the like the uh, the first one, but without the preceding tail, and just finishes like with a with a nice like tidy end rather than like going off to like one of the kind of stand standing points. This was done like this can kind of be shown where we group them like similar kind of shaped characters. So uh, the connection between an A and a B is the same as, a uh, as the A and the N. And we realized that this was kind of, uh, you know, hitting two birds with one stone because it made our lives easier, but it also made the children's lives easier in the case that they were drawing the same kind of connections and the same shapes between different characters, thus simplifying the process of doing joined up handwriting. Um, and this really came from looking at a bunch of like their star pupils' homework that we were given as reference material. So here, were, here was like us, like two type designers, referencing primary schools, uh, primary school children's uh, handwriting as reference for this typeface, which was like a really like uh, revitalizing kind of process and really kind of like nice to take yourself out of like the realm of you know conventional design, I guess. And if that wasn't enough, we realized that there was. Um, there were other kind of options for doing cursive handwriting, um, different stylized variants of S's, R's, Z's. So we also included those in stylistic sets, um, thus in creating more and more problems. But we thought it was quite a nice way to kind of show, because um, especially as we released the typeface um, commercially, we wanted other schools to be able to try and adopt this. And if they had a particular type of cursive that they were teaching, to be able to, like, uh, be able to use this as well. Um, keeps going. It fine. does, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to kind of like go through because it went from here like into the final kind of versions of the typeface, which were used for uh, the the teachers to sh use as like classroom tools, um, which were like instructional versions. So, for example, here you had um, how to draw the letters, which again brought in like some really interesting questions of how to kind of unified the drawing of letters. Uh, we all sat down in the studio um, and all drew like drew the letters and of how we'd kind of construct them. And there was lots of like arguments of like, oh no, you do it like this. Uh, you know, for example, I I now draw a uh, capital E with like a C and then like with a stroke in the middle, but that's, that's everyone, everyone does it different. <laughs> so um, we had to kind of create this set of rules um, where we, and versions. So we had this version where you could kind of just as a reference sheet, this one, so you could uh, you could kind of like trace the characters, and then when you're kind of a pro at drawing your letters, then you have this one without any aids, as these children here are doing. Um, and to kind of top the project off, um, we were really honoured to be um, nominated for Design of the Year 
uh, in 2014 at the Design Museum, um, in, wi in which to celebrate that we created a small publication to kind of show the overview of, of the typeface uh, in its entirety in like a printed kind of form. Okay, I'm going to talk about um, one more project, um, five years. This is kind of a strange point for us. We would always talk to the beginning if we made it to five years as a company, we wanted to kind of do something um, that kind of showed it off somehow. Um, but it's obviously kind of quite a strange or young point in time to like look retrospectively back at what you're doing. So we kind of tried to approach it in a different way and looking at as a type foundry what we've done. Um, I'm going to kind of show like a quick video now, um, which is kind of going to show the opening kind of night, but then I'll explain what this is, so kind of bear with me a sec. Um, so our idea was to look at our role as a type designers, um, which is a kind of a strange world at points for us. Um, so obviously we run a design studio and, and a type foundry, but kind of creating a commercially available typeface is one of kind of positive and negative points. Um, so we, there's kind of many occasions when we've turned up to somewhere and gone to the kind of equivalent of a spa, like a local kind of news agent in, in another country, and they're using our typeface to kind of sell hot dogs, um, which is kind of like a negative point. And then there's other points when we go to like an exhibition and it's like one of your favorite architects and they're using your typeface in their new monograph, which is like fantastic. Um, they both kind of have their you know, pros and cons. So we decided to look at the typeface as someone who kind of like loses control, someone who's like a, a complicit enabler, a passive collaborator or a disembodied author, someone who kind of abstractly collaborates with someone at any kind of given point in time. And like the story doesn't end when we release the typeface. The story continues through other people's work. Um, somehow that we have a design process within, um, the typeface has a design solution within it and how you use it is kind of communicated through that. So we kind of created 26 um, fictional existences that showed um, objects with our typefaces applied. And these objects were kind of created or chosen on having their kind of a ubiquitous form, a kind of a form that you would kind of imagine existed. So, for example, um, one of the objects, an egg box, I'm sure everyone in this room would draw something very similar to that, maybe not that angle, but that kind of form. Whereas if everyone in the room drew a chair, it probably would be quite different. So the idea was about how we applied the typeface to that object. Um, so every single object represented one, type, one singular typeface and we used one singular weight on applied onto that object and wrote all the copy as well and all the content. So all the copy is kind of like very slightly left of field, a bit tongue in cheek. There's some small kind of moments and ideas in, in them. And these are all 3D renders. So as kind of you saw in the video, we um, kind of had a gallery opening on in April, and we actually 3D rendered that whole space, and all of these objects were applied in that space and kind of had these kind of mimic shots, or that's what the kind of idea of these images were. They were shots within the gallery, but kind of trying to keep that neutral kind of existence as well. Um, so yeah, it's like 26, 26 pieces of work. It was a really kind of, again, like a massive technical challenge. Um, we'd never done 3D rendering before, and we ended up, I think eating every single meal in the studio, um, which was great, but also horrible. Um, and lots of kind of different moments of like rendering things at kind of large sizes. So these are all 50 by 70 prints, so quite kind of, kind of time consuming to output them. Um, so yeah, these are all, all the renders. Um, 
but this is this is kind of again like as with Castle Down, there's kind of parallels to this that our kind of work is not self. I mean, at points self commissioned, but also it becomes laboriously technical and and kind of exaggerated and larger. The scope grows all the time. Um, and this is something we kind of really enjoy. And um, this is actually reference from that uh, kind of scene in American Beauty when the bag kind of floats over. So we kind of had lots of discussions about things and moments in films we liked where we wanted to kind of reference them, um, but subtly as well. So, yeah. And um, to top it kind of off, we... This is actually installed in the space. Um, to top it off, we kind of decided to draw a typeface um, for this, but obviously we had to draw a typeface. Um, what, how, what, is the, what is the most neutral typeface? What is the typeface that suits kind of, I guess, um, the container of 26 or 25 other typefaces. That's quite a kind of difficult kind of challenge, a brief. So we decided to do a redraw of, of times based on early photo stats from um, Willie, um, Stanley, Stanley Burgess. Um, so he's a kind of disembodied author of times. So several type um, historians kind of believe that he was kind of pushed aside. So it kind of perfectly suited this kind of parallel and this narrative of us being someone who kind of gives away and kind of loses control at points. Um, and then we kind of also commissioned uh, a piece of writing by Eileen Kwan, um, and she kind of wrote about the type designer in, I guess, the cultural kind of canon and, and like existence. So there's not really, it doesn't really talk about type designers, but there's lots of kind of parallels between different things meaning different things to different cultures, but they're the same thing. So here, this is really great about the donut being called different kind of variations of the same kind of sweet confectionery, um, but they're not all unholy, um, which is like a really, it was a really great kind of piece of um, writing because it was quite, we just kind of commissioned her and again, just let her get on with it, which is a really nice outcome. Um, we drew like five symbols, all kind of abstract kind of meanings of, of five as well, and then published this small kind of catalogue um, to top it all off, um, which is available now to buy. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.